So welcome everybody to our webinar on why Village Care chose Fire to power its provider search experience. Today we are joined by our friends at Village Care Max, Stuart Meyer and Kuipo Curry. Village Care is a not-for-profit insurance carrier serving full eligible Medicare and Medicaid ben beneficiaries in the four boroughs of New York City. Stuart has a broad background leading IT and operational redesign efforts for large health and human services organizations, managed care organizations, home healthcare agencies, and nonprofits. Since 2015, as the CIO of Village Care, Stuart's primary focus is the redesign of Village Care's IT organization and processes to support its strategic vision and growth. In addition, Stuart has led the charge in transforming Village Care to be a data-driven organization. This has included both the technical aspects of a cloud-based strategy, as well as the human capital component of analyst skill assessments, training, and tools. Kuipo Curry is the Director of Data Management at Village Care. And while there, she has been managing the fire-based interoperability requirements program, as well as building out Village Care's AWS cloud infrastructure. He is also working to increase all employees' data literacy through targeted training and standing up data governance for the organization. And on the LEAP side, we're joined today by co-founders David Finney and Renal Basker, myself, Jake Tunney, product manager for Convergent, our provider data management platform. LEAP Orbit is the trusted innovation partner to many of the biggest market-leading health data networks, including CRISP, Manifest Medics, Sync Health, as well as the policymakers who oversee them. And before we jump in um, to Village Care and the topic today, we wanted to give a brief overview of sort of the regulatory environment that is driving these changes. And David Finney, um, I'm going to go to you for that. So if you would like to take it over from here, that would sure. be great. Yeah, thanks, Jake, and and most importantly, thanks, Kuipo and Stu, for for uh, joining us today. We're we're excited to have you and excited about the work that we're doing together. Um, I, I mean, I guess just to this is really stage setting, but um, you know, the thirty thousand foot view here is provider data. Generally speaking, is a big mess. It's a big challenge for the industry, and it has been for a really really long time. Um, based on some of the 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 data that I've seen, um, the estimates are that this is something like a $2 billion a year problem for health plans and, and a $2 billion a year problem, again, for provider organizations, just trying to keep their networks um, straight and organized and accurate. Um, so it's sort of in that context that, that CMS has started to draw lines in the ground and say, we are, we are going to get into the business of creating carrots and sticks um, that motivate stakeholders to clean up their provider data. Um, and I think what we've seen over the last, you know, 18 months to, to two years is sort of a, a layering of uh, more and more challenging requirements that are being imposed, um, in this case, since we're talking about health plans, uh, on health plans to say, make your networks more transparent, more usable, and more accurate. Um, so we've started with the CMS interoperability rule, which finally went into effect uh, this, this past summer um, that said health, health plans, um, you will make your networks available via public fire APIs so that anybody could come along who, who wanted to ingest that data. Um, and, uh, it should be accurate within 30 days of, of any change um, that, that's, that the plan's been made aware of. So that's kind of like layer number one. Um, layer number two, in, uh, in last year's CMS managed care rules, sort of focused on the experience of interacting with the provider directory uh, by consumers or, or by members. Um, essentially what these rules say is, um, You've got to make a provider directory accessible to your members in a way that is um, sensitive to those with disabilities and accessibility challenges. Um, that is mobily responsive, meaning you can 
access the network and search the network on your computer or on your phone or your tablet or whatever in a user-friendly way. Um, and the, the plan, the network information that's presented um, on the website has to include certain things like, um, you know, just for instance, what languages are spoken in the office? Is the office uh, handicapped, accessible, things like that. Um, last but not least, uh, and, and certainly not last in the sense of, you know, what may still be to come is the No Surprises Act, which is the big uh, cost transparency and surprise billing law that was uh, passed by Congress uh, late last year. Um, and, and so, you know, the No Surprises Act, I think really ratchets this thing up even farther. Um, and it says, uh, starting with uh, plan years beginning in 2022, um, provider directories that are publicly facing, member facing, um, must be updated um, within two business days of receiving a provider update from some upstream data source. Um, and uh, even more challenging or, or aggressively for the plans, if a member makes a decision about their care based on what they see in that provider directory, um, and then they get a surprise bill, because let's say the directory said a particular provider's in network and it turns out they're not, um, there's a process by which they can, they can make their health plan uh, pay the difference between the, the in-network and the out-of-network charges. Um, so what we're seeing is sort of su sunlight, uh, shining sunlight on, on um, what at times has not been good data, um, and then, and then new consequences for um, for providing data to members uh, that's that's inaccurate. Um, so I think it's kind of in, in this big context, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Jake. Um, that you know that this work has been happening, and, and that Village Care I think has really been trying to look over over the next hill and position the plan for um, for this new world that we're living in. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for that great context. <clears throat> So I think that's a perfect segue to going into and asking the questions to the village care folks. So why did you make this decision to base your provider web search experience on your Fire APIs? So Stu or, or Kuipo, um, I'll defer to you. Maybe Stu, could you kick us off there? Yeah, uh, you know, I was listening. Dave, that was a great kind of framework that uh, you led off with, and I, you know, I was taking some notes, but, you know, as I think about it, um, you know, Village Care's decision was just kind of a natural extension of everything that David led, uh, told us about, spoke of, and also was also the kind of a, a natural migration of the work we've been doing within Village Care, really, uh, you know, led by Kuipo, who will, uh, you know, I'm sure have a lot to say about this, but basically our own kind of data strategy over the last couple of years, starting with the revamping of our data warehouse to, uh, uh, to AWS Redshift, to training, to tools. That now we're presented and we're really excited about, you know, these um, fire interoperability uh, uh, requirements because they really allowed us to get, get additional resources and, really get uh, business ownership excited about the prospect of exposing our data, you know, directly for uh, member benefit. So, you know, when we went down this road of meeting the regulatory requirements, which, uh, you know, were fairly easily met as it came to the provider data. But uh, beyond that, we became kind of a little fixated on how can we make it a better member experience. You know, we're a small plan. We have a hard, fairly hard to reach uh, uh, membership. So how, you know, what can we do to really leverage this in a way that makes the most sense for our, uh, for our members? And that's where, you know, we put our focus on uh, really not just meeting the fire requirements, but then using those uh, same requirements through our fire server and through uh, our good friends at Leap Orbit in exposing this data uh, to a kind of uh, freestanding directory search that, you know, yes, we make it available through um, uh, health application APIs, but also it's now, you know, really popping up everywhere on our, on our website for our members. We're now working with Leap Orbit to 
make it available to uh, business operations in different ways using slightly different data. So um, it really kind of was a natural extension, I guess is a long way of saying it, uh, on really uh, leveraging the work and really looking for, uh, you know, business purposes and business advantages. But at the end, it was really the member experience that I think was the key driver. Yeah, I think I think sometimes we lose sight of the end reason why we why why we do things, and and I think that's a great perspective to keep in mind, and making sure that data is accurate for members is so important to help them drive the right care decisions. Yeah. Uh, Kuipo, do you have anything to add on that? I know you were sort of instrumental in in architecting this vision. Yeah, I want to, uh, let me, uh, can I share my screen or at least post this beautiful, the user interface that you guys created? So we basically came mm -hmm. to Leap Orbit and said, look, all of our patients are really old. Um, they maybe have vision problems, hard time seeing. And so we really kind of started from there of like, okay, what's the user experience here? How can you make it simple? Um, really large typefaces, really clear. I like to call it like the Google of uh provider directories because it is just so so simple um, and then also we spent a lot of time putting it in front of our members and asking them to, to find a provider and to show us like what what was a struggle what was easy and getting their feedback um, so behind the scenes was all the fire interoperability stuff that we were required to do but we were able to work with leap orbit to make sure that the wrapper was incredibly user-friendly 508 compliant really fast, really responsive, really simple, um, and really helpful. And it was great because once we launched it, um, all of our internal users, so basically member services and provider relations themselves, were using the member search rather than using any of their internal tools that we had built for them because I like the simplicity of it so much. Um, and so that was, it was sort of moving that entire platform and the back end to fire was a requirement. Um, but while we were the front end was something that Leap Orbit created, behind the scenes there were a lot of like process issues that we knew had to go away. So we couldn't do a monthly web directory. We could no longer do kind of manually created PDFs. We really had to move to this world, like David said, of the two day, you know, refresh your data every two days where it had to be automated. We had to take all the humans out of it, no manual processes. It had to be automated. It had to be a live feed almost um, from our TPA. And so all of these things were really difficult to, to grapple with. And so we basically just went, look, our fire server is basically giving us all of this data. It's available. It's in a standard format. Let's leverage that instead of trying to recreate a process or try to, to fix any of our other processes. Um, and I think also the the vendor we used to be working with that did our original website for all of Village Care. Um, I think we pivoted to a different vendor or they no longer wanted to do the provider search. So it was sort of perfect because we were already building with Leap Orbit and it sort of pushed up our um, delivery date. And it was kind of, we had to turn it on. I think we had to flip the switch really quickly at the last minute to have a provider search. But the moment it was live, everybody was just sort of delighted with it. Yeah, so it's been a, it's really a really cool, a really cool thing. Awesome. Okay. Um, so we started talking about some of the benefits of, of leveraging fire in this way. Are the, what, um, what are you seeing as sort of un, unforeseen consequences of pointing your source of truth at this fire server? So has, has anything sort of come to light about your operations or, um, the actual underlying data that you've discovered through through leveraging fire in this way. Um, let me take the first crack at this one. I think um, you know. I think there was um, kind of a you know there was a I think there was a lot of kind of discussion about provided data, but it was almost like a kind of a, a business sense that. You know, it was kind of so messed up and so like hard to handle. The best we really could do is tread water. You know, we, we, we get reports from our TPA about 
maybe claims not processing because we don't have the right uh, uh, MTIs or whatever the situation was. But there was a sense that the best we could do was kind of fix it as we go. And I think through this general exposure of the uh, fire data and the fact that it's so easily accessible now through these interactive uh, kind of provider directories, I think there's a sense of, you know, the data may not be perfect, but at least like we have a, a business sense that it is manageable and uh, we can get our arms around it and we could set up work processes to take corrective measures. And, uh, you know, this is no easy thing for uh, for village care. And I imagine for most health plans, as uh, you mentioned in your opening uh, remarks, um, but there is a sense that, you know, now we can, uh, you know, we at least can do this. And uh, I think that's really one of the, the key benefits. Anything to add there, Kalipa? Yeah, I would say that it exposed a ton of like um, mm -hmm. yeah. issues that we knew, we had a feeling were there, but there was no way to like visualize the crazy until we were able to start mm -hmm. looking and iterating with it. Um, using the Leap Orbit front end. And so I think with the moment we did that, so like specialties, for example, or even our languages, it wasn't until we actually had, we, we were mm -hmm. basically taking the raw data and just visualizing it. And there were a, few, a lot of messes that came up that made the provider team go, oh my God, what is this? We got to fix this. What is it? Um, or even like we had some of the, the Chinese American um, provider relations reps go through it and say like, oh, look, the translations are really funny. You have it as Chinese person, rather Chinese language. And so it was just stuff like that where we were able to get all the different parts of the organization to actually go and look at the data and what we were showing people um, in a way that we were able to then clean it. And basically say, okay, we know this is a it looks like this is a data issue, or even like phone numbers, for example. We we know that there's an issue with phone numbers, and a lot of the provider data that's entered by our TPA, they basically just use placeholders for phone numbers, and you can see that in the data. Um, there's a couple other things that they do, and we were never able to really see the extent of that when they were packaging a web directory for us and giving it to us every every month. And so when we started to see the quality of the data, it made it possible for us to fix it. Um, so. It kind of makes me smile. I mean, how often is it that a very simple sort of regulatory action, you know, really kind of strikes at the strikes at the challenge? It's like we're going to require the industry to make this problem more visible to everyone. And then it's like, oh, my gosh, like now that we can see it. Um, <laughs> We better do something about it. <laughs> yeah. And I think the way right. that they've, they've approached it more with like, it, it's like threatened sticks, but I think that the way that they've approached it, like, we know that this is hard and we're not going to punish you yet or fine you yet for this stuff, but we'd like you to work on it. And I think just kind of making, like, tip it, turning the rock over to see all the worms underneath, you can see that, like, it's, it's basic, basic data errors and basic data quality stuff. That, that anyone would notice. Um, and so that's been really cool. The other thing that, that has turned out to be really interesting about it is in pushing us towards having something that is like an API enabled service. It basically, all these other systems that we work with within healthcare that we um, kind of use as our systems of truth, not a lot of them will work with APIs. And so, I mean, this happened yesterday with the phone systems. We were trying to figure out how to connect our phone system to a repository to be able to get back information. Our care management system won't do it. Our claim system won't do it. We'd have to build something special for our cloud, but then like our fire server is sitting right there and it can, it can take API calls um, and return, you know, patient resources or provider resources or whatever. And so it was basically like a go-to kind of like universal connector block for all these different services. Um, so it's been really interesting to use it in that way as well. I think there's just a general sense that, hey, we can actually own our data. I mean, we've been talking about it for, I think since Kuipo joined, uh, that was one of the first things she said when she joined Village Care, you know, we got to own our data. And I'm like, well, good luck. 
you know, is sitting over here in our CPA and, you know, we get these, uh, you know, we get their reports after they process the data. It's not the actual source data. And, uh, you know, though we made some headway, I think this is really one of the first practical uh, examples of us truly owning our data. And I think it also helps foster a kind of a sense of accountability. You know, it's not so easy just to always kick it down the road around our data quality issues back, you know, the TPA is entering it wrong or, you know, we have timing issues, but, you know, here it is, it's real time, fix it, and then, you know, move on. So I think, uh, you know, in that sense, it's really been uh, you know, a great benefit. So talk to me about some of the future use cases that you're seeing um, kind of come to light. Or, or You mentioned one briefly about your phone system, but I know you're thinking about other potential use cases like reporting or, or other solutions that you can base on fire, like care management. Well, I think even just going back to the provider directory, I mean, um, the fact that so we're, we're a community-based plan. We do a lot of kind of boots on the ground marketing efforts. We have storefronts and, uh, you know, we engage with the community around a, a number of, uh, you know, issues and it's very high touch. You know, that's, that, that's the market, that's our niche, high touch plans that supply, you know, provide our members with kind of a, a host of services to enable them to age uh, with dignity in the home. And I say all that because, uh, you know, we don't have a sales staff, we have benefit advisors and they go out and they're in the community and, uh, you know, they, they are answering questions uh, of, of members and of potential members. And when it comes to potential members, you know, real time now we can just say, oh, you, do, you know, you, you are the physician that you're working with is in the network or they're not in the network and we can get steps to bring them in, uh, you know, to, to help you uh, make the decision for uh, towards village care. So, you know, that's just one example. It wasn't really top of mind when we started this, but then you start meeting with uh, our business customers around, uh, you know, some of these use cases and some of these projects around CRM support, for example, Another great example, as we look at our member service area, you know, we're always dependent upon these one-off data feeds, but through these APIs and through FHIR, um, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, we can populate a CRM system with a really holistic 360 view of the member. And it just makes that member kind of, that member experience around that problem call or or that check-in call, so much more beneficial. The same would be done uh, is true for our care management, uh, telehealth calls, or assessment visits, etc. I mean, yeah, there's been a lot of, you know, everyone talks about patient 360, and oh, can't we get a complete view of, of the patient? Yeah. And I have to say, like, the one of the few sources where all of the data is in one place for all of our members are, is, is in our fire server, just because we had to do all that work to map it. And so it's basically like, well, if that's what the member is seeing, why don't we also give our member service reps that same access? Because it, it is consolidating all the information that does not exist in the systems that they get to work with every day. Um, and so that's also a really cool place is you can connect it to CRMs. Um, we can also use the provider data. You know, we still need network management. We need to be able to, to manage those providers. And that's another big thing that we're hoping to find a solution for or build it, hopefully using these standards. Um, there's also, you know, like credentialing, for example. So there's a lot of opportunity to use FHIR, like transmitting data back and forwards in a FHIR format for credentialing. That would be awesome. I still don't know of any products that are doing that. A lot of the credentialing platforms are also kind of just trying to figure this out. So it's it's an interesting moment in that I think there's a lot of things shifting and changing, but at least having like this, this universal connector um, is incredibly helpful um, to fix a lot of the the things that are super manual processes within our organization and and hopefully others. Stu and Kuipo, well, thank thank you for all, all of this. It's it's really music to my ears. As as a lifelong 
enterprise architect, technology architect, I, I, I see some sort of obvious design patterns at play here. Um, and, and it just makes me happy. So, you know, you've talked about service oriented architecture for a very long time. Uh, it's too, right? That's right. <laughs> and so like, how, how yeah. do you take different data domains? You got patient data domain, you got provider data, you got uh, claims data, you got all, all these different uh, things. And, and, and you may have uh, some things outsourced, right? You know, to a TPA uh, for some of those things. But um, the, the way you integrate matters. The way you empower not just one use case matters, right? But, but an entire set of use cases, some that you haven't even thought about, that matters. And that's why I think, you know, the API centric uh, thinking is, is very, very uh, useful because now, now you can enable interactions between systems and take out some, some of the human components out of it and, and make it more seamless and, and error uh, uh, proof. And so, you know, th those, those kind of things um, come to my mind. But one thing that just occurred to me, and I, I was thinking about another regulation um, that's, um, that's in play right now, which is about providers, uh, sorry, payers access to patients data when they become a new member, right? So now you have the ability to ask anybody, any EHR, um, you know, any, um, any provider organization for electronically uh, for you to get uh, a new member's health information. Um, and what that can do uh, to your process of onboarding a member, uh, but also um, over time, any kind of, you know, either actuary processes or other things that you do with that data. Uh, so that, that sort of opens up new, new frontiers and uh, possibilities. Um, any, any comments on that? No, I, I think that, uh, I think it's a, you know, a brave new frontier, let's just say. Yes, that's all true. You know, we, there is a lot of movement within the market. This really allows, you know, you have to think positively because there is, there are some risks also, but, you know, on the positive side, you're getting new members all the time. By understanding those members, their acuity levels, their, uh, their utilization really helps us as a community-based plan, uh, you know, assess that member uh, more specifically around the specific disease states, also aids in the development of care plans so that a member comes to us uh, not as an unknown uh, qual uh, quantity, but as someone that we really have a thorough understanding of their healthcare needs over the last few years. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great benefit. Uh, my only trepidation is that, you know, when you think about that, you certainly don't want it to be a factor in accepting that member or that patient or in, you know, or in uh, covering the condition or things like that. So I do think the regulation has, you know, just the kind of safeguard for the member. But yes. overall, I think it's the long hold promise of interoperability. You know, I remember... I sat on all these in New York. The um, the Rios were were the things uh, maybe ten years ago. I was on all these boards, and you know they were all talking interoperability, and we were all kind of doing it, but each one was doing it a little differently. And you know participation was a uh, you know could be an issue, but here you know it seems like uh, for the first time interoperability really does have legs, and it's really a uh, uh, the future of uh, integrated healthcare. And APIs are at the center of this, uh, this revolution. Right, and APIs at the center, exactly. I think we did a little bit of analysis when payer to pay, we were starting to, to gear up for payer to payer and sort of bulk data exchange. And we realized that we were just like one plan in a continuum. Yeah. And we oftentimes swap members back and forward between a couple different plans. Okay. So sometimes we were upstream and sometimes we were downstream, but there were a lot of patients that it was almost like musical chairs. We just hand them back and forth. They'd switch plans, they'd come back, they'd leave, they'd come back. And it was really kind of looking at it and being like, well, let's just share data upstream and downstream with these organizations. We don't have to wait for payer to payer. Um, let's just go identify them and work with them because it's as helpful for them to have our members' data as us to have theirs. Yes. Um, especially around like the pharmacy data has been really easy to swap back and forwards. 
And we have a lot of analytics built on top of um, our pharmacy data. So we can basically kind of look at someone's, um, their list of meds and check and see their, if they're taking them, what their frequency are, combinations to identify what, where, are, where do people need help? Like where do we need our chief mm-hmm. medical officer to reach out to them? So that kind of information would be really helpful to swap back and forth because we can make sure that people um, have sort of continuity with their drugs and their meds and they're taking their meds and they don't have ones that have weird interactions. Um, so it, there's a lot of opportunity there, it's super cool. Um, yeah, do you, do you do you do care ma- any kind of care management uh, type programs? Do you do you hold risk? Um, do you do any kind of you yeah. Know, yeah value based uh, bundles and things like all that? All of that. Yep. Of, okay. All of that. Um, any, you know, we offer. Uh, yeah. You, you know, the, primarily we operate in the LTSS market. Um, okay. In New York, it's called managed long term care. It's Medicaid funded, and it really. Um, provides the member with an envelope, you know, kind, kind of surrounds them with an envelope of services, all designed to keep them at home and discapitated. Uh, we bear the risk, at least for the Medicaid services. And then we have Medicare plans that uh, do all that, but also do the, uh, you know, the uh, physician, the hospitals, etc. And to really be successful in this, it really requires partnering with physician groups, um, and with, uh, you know, other uh, kind of like-minded organizations in these uh, risk-sharing and value-based uh, arrangements. I have a slightly different question. Um, this is probably maybe a stew question, but Kripa, I'm sure you have thoughts about it too. From, a, from an enterprise IT sort of financial uh, perspective, like Stu, how do you think about these investments you're, you're making in, in APIs and FIRE over the long term? I mean, what, one of the things that we, you know, we hear sometimes from plans is like a lot of the, the, the acquisition decisions are being made by compliance people saying like, oh, there's this new box you have to check. So you got to go spend a little bit of money on, on this thing and a project and then we check that box. And what we've, you know, what, what I kind of hopefully painted a picture at the beginning here is like, this is a cascading set of, of requirements. Um, and uh, if you stand up a, a fire, set of fire APIs, but you don't really address the business processes that sit behind them, um, or you're short-sighted, you're, you're probably going to end up ripping all of that out and, and doing the next project to meet the next requirement. So like, do, do you feel like, like over time, as, as you take a holistic approach to all of this, are there, do you expect to see real efficiencies in, in the business or, or is this just kind of um, all, you know, all in a day's work in terms of running the plan, uh, making the books? I, um, that's, a, that's actually a great question, David. Um, let me, let me give the short answer, which is, uh, you know, when this started, there was some, um, not, not to uh, take anything away from our fine compliance staff, but there really was this uh, bit of a mindset that it's a compliance, it's a regulatory requirement, like at all the others, and, and uh, you know, let's meet the minimum requirements and, and go on. Um, but I think um, th- there's a couple of things that really helped us. And one is, the fact that as an organization and, you know, the, uh, and with leadership backing really up to our board of directors, there was a sense that um, Village Care needed to be a data-driven organization. Uh, and that's how Kuipo joined us. And that's how we started these initiatives around staff and technology, uh, training, a bunch of activities. But so this kind of rode the coattails of that initiative which really helped. And I think it's really good to kind of frame when you have some of these regulatory items that really could benefit the, uh, you know, the business to kind of frame them in an overall strategy, right? So for us, it was uh, being a data-driven organization. The other thing is kind of the tactical level, uh, what we like to do is take a look at some of these use cases we've been discussing here and link them back to strategic goals. Okay, we got, you know, what plan doesn't have strategic goals around uh, member engagement, for example, or membership growth? 
you go back and you say, well, you know, of course this is supporting that. Look what we're doing for our sales staff. Look what we're doing for the member experience. And I think to kind of don't, you know, don't, don't look at it as one-off kind of project expenditures that are IT. Look at them as kind of strategic uh, expenditures that happen to have an IT component. You know, I think that's the, that's kind of how, uh, and, and I've gotten a lot of support around that from uh, the leadership team here at uh, Village Care. It's maybe it's a, it's a, it might be a little bit Machiavellian, but it's like never waste a crisis. Yeah. So basically, everybody yeah. was like, "Oh God, we got to do this interoperability thing." Ah, crisis! And it's like, well, strategically, what did we want? We wanted all of our data in one place. Great, let's use this as an opportunity to get us closer to that strategic goal. Um, and then efficiencies, like, yeah, we knew that there was a ton of manual work and manual processes happening within the organization that were. They were taking up a lot of time and they were also really expensive. And so basically kind of doing an end run around that to be like, okay, well, let's just step into this new world. If we have that, how would we change, you know, printed provider directories, for example. So like the, all the work that we, you guys did talking to Command Direct about how to use Fire to print out provider directories, right? Yeah. Automates that and saves hours and hours and hours of manual work a month and all of the 508 compliance costs every month for those provider directories so the efficiencies are there it was really just sort of like using the using the requirement and then basically just committing to it it's like okay what are we doing interoperability okay that means all the data and i mean even pushing um our vendor health samurai to put more provider data in our fire server than we needed than was required because it helps with all these other things yeah. One one thing I marvel that, um, you know, since we started working with you is just sort of the incrementalism that you thought think about, just sort of the, the next phase, the next phase, the next phase, and how we can sort of keep raising the bar on the, the innovation, the, the new infrastructure that's coming in, because you can always get uh, bogged down with large projects that take a lot of money and a lot of effort. Right. Um, but really, um, this sense of Hey, we can we can do innovations in little chunks, uh, little bits of work, um, just for the next two months. Let's do this thing, and that sort of moves us forward. Um, that's that's so so good and practical to see on the ground. My team jokes that it's like glacial pace, but the thing about glaciers is you can't stop them. <laughs> so <laughs> whenever we get stuck, we're like, oh, it's glacial change, glacial pace, and our architect goes, yes, but you can't stop a glacier. <laughs> I think the other thing I've, I've appreciated about the way you all have approached some of this work is that um, you can call this interoperability work or, or IT work, but inevitably it, it turns into uh, business process transformation work. Um, and you all have been you know, very open with us about sort of the, the life cycle of provider data as one of your you know, one of the elements of that service-oriented ar architecture, I guess. And, and you see all of the humans that touch it from, from you know, the, the, where it comes in to where it, where it goes out. Um, and, and to me, like, that, that's where some of the real opportunities for efficiency are. Like, you've got people touching data to manually intervene. Um, and it's, it's sort of undifferentiated, sort of, low skill work. It's probably not what they wake up in the morning, you know, being excited to come to work to do. And if you can kind of squeeze all of that out of the, the enterprise, you've freed up a lot of um, human capacity to do higher value stuff. I think we did a lot of work recently around um, data quality rules. So basically automating those using um, a data quality tool we have. So like for all the provider data, for example, there's a lot of like if then and buts of like, there were people that were manually going through Excel spreadsheets to try to filter, change the filters and make sure that all the different data elements matched. And it was like, well, no, we can, we can write that and that can be a check and we can do all the data all at once, just help us create those data rules. And so that's another piece that like working with the business to try to understand what their what problem they're solving and trying to automate it in a way that they recognize it as a, yes, that's, 
that's fixing my process is kind of the hard part. And I think the incremental, taking incremental chunks and making incremental change is a lot easier than like the big major changes, which I've found is kind of hard. It's hard to get people to buy into like a great big change. True. All right, guys. I think this has been a, a really pithy conversation and uh, I don't have any Q&A, but I think we've generated enough Q&A with our own selves here for, for a really great conversation. So I'm not sure um, you guys are ready to wrap up just yet, but uh, I don't know, David or Renal, do you have any other questions for Stu and Quipo? Or do you think this is a good time to probably wrap up? I, I, I do have one question, uh, self-servingly, because I'm, I've been looking at this problem too. Um, you, you talked about credentialing. Can you walk us through what do you do for credentialing man, uh, management and, and sort of data life, life cycle. And how does that relate to your, your provider data yeah. initiatives? Uh, I've been trying to untangle that one for a couple of years, actually, because it's <laughs> like there's different, there's different teams within the credentialing or provider relations department. And so as I've tried to kind of take the approach of like, what is it that you, what do you need versus what do you need versus what do you need? It seems to me that there's like three different systems that are like essential needs for that team. One of them is the credentialing system, which is basically just kind of passing information back and forth to a, a credentialing organization to get kind of up to date. Does this person exist? Is this a real person? Do they have any kind of lawsuits out against them? What's their phone number? What's their address? So that credentialing piece, like are their licenses up to date? Um, and so there's one person in our organization that does that, where all she does is look at the rosters of our um, in-network providers and make sure that their credentials are, are up to date. A lot of which can be automated. Oh my God, yeah, you think, right? right? So like we work with CAQH and they're basically passing us JSON files back and forth, but it, it's kind of like one of those things where they have their own, they have their own interface and none of the the none of the systems so not, that the credentialing have, platforms yeah. that we have connect to that or people want to be their own credentialing organization so like that's one component of what provider relations does the next piece is like the network management stuff which is more like a crm function of like who is this doctor who what organizations do they work with kind of what what do we need from them and then the other part is just operations there's all these reports that they have to generate all the time about network adequacy or like the provider directories. Gary's on the phone. Um, he can talk about printing out giant the giant phone books of our provider directories. Um, but it's really, there's all these different functions. And so, you know, from when I started, they were like, we need a credentialing system that'll manage all of our data. But when you go to credentialing systems and say like, do you also do network management? They're like, no, we only manage credentialing. And so because the majority of our organization is, kind of outsourced, outsourced services. So we have a lot of our provider networks are outsourced. So we, we don't directly credential them. They basically, the hospitals credential them and just send us the information. So it's basically like this patchwork of all these external sources that will pass information back and forth in, in their way, um, but they don't necessarily talk to each other or are a format that each other uses. And so basically we're kind of sitting here in the middle trying to figure out how to connect all these different flat files, try to keep them organized, uh, try to make them work together. And then, you know, our provider team says, we just, we want our data all in one place. Just put it all in one place. We're like, but you've got so much data from me, from four different, five different places. What do you, how am I, what, what am I supposed to do here? Um, so that, that's sort of what I think credentialing the provider, the provider team says that they want one system to like rule them all, but it sounds like the, you, have, you need a system that can do those three or four different functions. Sure. And, and that's hard. Like I haven't seen that in the market anywhere. People are usually like, it's Salesforce and they're a CRM or they're a credentialing <laughs> platform and they're Cactus and they just do credentialing or, right? There's nothing that sort of works together. Or you go to another organization and they'll do credentialing for you, but they're going to charge you three times as much to do your network management. Right. So it's kind of hard. Yeah, no, you, you are, you are, 
reaffirming um, what we've been sort of noodling over in the market. Like there is this little bit of a market gap. Uh, obviously, you know, COQH and organizations like that, and and as, as you talked about, the delegated uh, providers um, that are being managed by their own provider organizations. Right. Um, you know, bringing all. And I think. Uh, yeah. Go and on. just to add a little more color, you know, many of our providers are, let's just say, they're not they're non-standard healthcare providers. Yes. Right. So when we go into this area, you know, we have this. Uh, these community-based uh, service providers, Meals on Wheels, transportation, uh, you know, all these ancillary services that must be credentialed and must be in our network and have to go through this whole kind of data cleansing process that, you know, is a very non-standard uh, manual uh, kind of spreadsheet-driven activity at this point. Okay. Yeah. So we we are we are uh, beginning to work on a on a thing here. So um, hopefully we'll we'll be able to bring something to the market. I'd love to uh, talk more with you about that about your ideas there. Could could you are you're uh, muted. Sorry, Gary just posted that I would add that the standardization and simplification the data processing for creating a provider directory allows us to better meet the CMS timeliness for directory creation and distribution. Oh yeah, and a more automated approach to 508 compliance. You're correct. And I, I would really love your perspective if any of your other customers are kind of coming at it from the fire point of view of like, hey, look, here's this data repository. Can you create provider directories based on this standard set or if everybody's still kind of manually sending you like individually handcrafted bespoke um, provider directories. I don't know how to make Gary talk. Yeah, let's, why don't we bring Gary in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Gary works for Command Direct. So Command Direct does a lot of our, um, our printing and fulfillment of our paper provider directories. Um, yeah, Gary, what have you been seeing as an opportunity here? There's Gary, he's joining now, I believe. Command, command performance for uh, Command Direct here. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. And I'm sorry, I uh, when I joined again as a panelist, it disconnected me for a second, so I apologize. Oh, good. Um, just in response to that last question, I can share that um, we're in conversations with um, a lot of our clients relating to the, um, to the new requirements, but um, I think that many of them um, are, are really struggling to figure out um, the approach for their organization due to their structure. And, um, and I think that, you know, with Leap Orbit's approach, um, there's not just the service that's being provided, but the education and, and the consultative approach, because it is very new to everyone. So I think each organization has its own challenges. And on my side with printing and 508, um, it just adds another layer of complexity. So, um, so it is a challenge for plans. And I think Village Care uh, and this, you know, uh, you know, the fact that you guys have been through this illustrates how, um, how challenging it can be, but that it can be overcome uh, with the right approach. So it's definitely a learning process for many of the plans right now. Um, and I think, I think this is a really good start. Yeah, thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gary. Yeah, I think uh, the way that um, sort of put a bow on this is we're, we're, we are seeing sort of best in class um, point solutions like Command Direct and like Leap Orbit's provider directory web search that fit well with um, Fire APIs and sort of um, we see as the next generation in, in um, health plan, web applications, and um, operational workflow tools, leveraging the Fire APIs. And I think it gives us, when, when designing with Fire, it gives us an opportunity to 
build with interoperability first. Um, and that's, I think, a brand new paradigm in healthcare. And uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to be on this journey with everybody here and, and sort of um, looking to the future and how we can uh, make people's lives better and make sure that we're getting the right data in front of people and make and also making sure that the, the folks on the inside of the health plans enjoy their work. And, and it's not just a struggle every day to make one update to a provider directory. So that just seems silly. Um, so with that in mind, I, I think uh, this is a good time to probably close this conversation. I thought it was really good. We'll have the recording up um, in probably early next week. So feel free to share that with your networks. And uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Thanks, thanks Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. Oh. Bye. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone.